Uh, I'm really delighted to uh, invite everybody uh, to this afternoon's session where Liam Cahill, who's uh, a good and long-standing friend of us all in the labour history world and the Labour History Society, is going to speak about his recent publication on the life and legacy of Mossy Quinlan. Uh, and uh, Liam, I presume you'll start off by telling us about the family connections and then the story from uh, the Shur to Harama and uh, all, all places in between. We'll have an opportunity for um, Q&A through the chat button at the end of the session. Uh, so, uh, and hopefully between uh, Liam's presentation and um, questions and comments, um, uh, we'll try and get you away uh, in around five o'clock. So thanks very much. And uh, I'll hand you straight over to Liam for um, what uh, should be a very, very interesting afternoon session. So Liam, if you unmute yourself and away we go. Liam, can you unmute? Well, yeah. For a mahagot of Hamish, for a mahagot, August, the one of my workers, a while at Fanny, August, come while the comments there had looked ever in the hair and Austin Guire, a host from Lower Tresham Drum in you, August, come while you see in Quirum, Pajas, Fihe, Rick Gahania, a fan shawl young thing in you, August, Sasurgan Gunnishi, Harry Vegan, August, Peter Tanyan, as a will of Raga, come on. Morris Patrick Quinlan always known as Mossy, was born on the 17th of March, 1911. His father, also named Morris, is variously described in official documents as a butcher or a cattle dealer, and his mother, Eileen Reedy, as a clerk. They were both aged 19 when they married. Mossy was born nine months and two days later. The young couple and their son, lived in a lodging house in Tremor, County Waterford. Cattle dealers, of course, no longer exist uh, until livestock came on the scene in the early 70s of the last century. They were the middlemen who bought cattle from farmers and sold them on to local butchers or for export to Britain. It was hard work. Uh, they were self-employed, but it was precarious and the financial rewards sometimes could be good. Three more boys were born in fairly quick order, Michael, Eamon and Terence. Mossy went to school in the Christian Brothers Water Park College in Waterford, where Frank Edwards was a few years ahead of him. The name college and the playing of rugby was intended to signify that it was for upwardly aspiring Catholics rather than the brothers' schools where Gaelic games were played, but it was convenient to where, uh, where the family lived at that time. In 1924, when Mossy was aged 13 and his youngest brother was only three, their mother died of TB. Less than 18 months later, his father remarried to Agnes Walsh from Wexford Town, she was aged uh, 45, described as a spinster, and she was 10 years older than him. And I discovered since the book was first published that they were, which I didn't know at the time, they were married in Paddington in London, which might seem a strange uh, choice of venue. But I understand that it was the custom in Waterford, uh, perhaps more widely elsewhere in the country, that where a widower was marrying for the second time out of respect to the first wife's family, uh, the marriage was not solemnized in the home parish. And in Waterford, the tradition was that they went to the Cistercian Monastery in Mount Mellory in West Waterford, or sometimes they came to Dublin and would have gone to a Jesuit church in, in Dublin. But when you think about it and when you look at the map, the connectivity between Waterford and London, Paddington specifically, was very, very easy. You just, you walk down to the railway station, you put a ticket and that ticket took you all the way to Rosslare, onto the British Rail boat to Fishguard, and then train from Fishguard 
brought you directly into London, into Paddington Station. So they followed the tradition uh, of leaving Waterford for the, the second marriage, but went to a place which was much further away in London. Now, in 1920, the early part of 1920, local government elections took place. And in those elections, we saw continuing that huge surge to Sinn Féin that had been noted first in the general election of December 1918. And Sinn Féin swept into power and into control of many local authorities throughout the country. And on that wave, um, Mossy's father and some of his uncles were elected to Waterford Corporation as Sinn Féin councillors. However, the linchpin of the Quinlan family, economically and politically, was Alderman Morris Quinlan, Mossy's grandfather. Over a couple of generations from the mid 19th century, the family had risen from living in a two roomed dwelling in a laneway and running an outdoor butcher stall to the alderman owning a fine townhouse, a small farm, and two butcher shops and a spell as mayor of Waterford. As their prosperity increased over the years, the family's political allegiances traversed a familiar route from friendship with Thomas Francis Marr and membership of the Young Irelanders, to the Fenians, to Parnell, to the Redmondite uh, pro-Parnell faction of the Irish Parliamentary Party, and to the Irish Volunteers. However, in September 1914, after John Redmond's call to young Irishmen to go wherever the firing line extends, Alderman Quinlan and his family broke irrevocably with him. They remained with the Irish Volunteers. A few months after the Easter Rising of 1916, the family founded the first Sinn Féin club in Waterford City. A few years later, they plunged deeply into the bitterly contested by-election that followed John Redmond's death in 1918 in Waterford. The anti-conscription movement saw them being involved as well, and again, a bitterly contested general election of 1918. And this was the political environment in which Mossy grew up. However, by the time he reached the age of 21, the economic war with Britain was looming. The family business was not big enough to absorb him. There was a recession and cattle dealing was falling on hard times. So he stepped out of his lower middle class background into the proletariat and started working as a salesman or a commercial traveler Again, another occupation that has since disappeared. Mossy had been in the Air and Scouts and was a member of the post-Civil War IRA. He came into contact in those organizations with other young men like Frank Edwards and Peter O'Connor. When Peter formed the Waterford Workers Study Circle, Mossy joined. And it's interesting to note that Five members of that group later fought in Spain with the 15th International Brigade. They studied Marx and Lenin. They came to the view that an armed struggle for a republic alone was not enough. In tandem, Mossy, Peter, Frank and the others moved inexorably to the left towards the Republican Congress and the Communist Party of Ireland. The Congress was extremely active politically and in agitprop in the Waterford of the 1930s. They mounted big campaigns against slum housing, rack renting, uh, and in support of striking building workers. A decisive factor in their pivot towards the Republican Congress was their attendance at the 1934 Wolf Tone commemoration in Bowdenstown. They were severely disillusioned by the attacks mounted by some IRA elements against a contingent of workers from the Shankfield in Belfast. Frank Edwards was the Republican Congress organizer in Waterford and a major campaign was organized 
to get him reinstated after his dismissal from his teaching job in Mount Sinai Christian Brothers School. A highlight of the campaign was a huge public meeting in the city. The Catholic bishop condemned it and warned that attendance would be a mortal sin. And despite that, 4,000 hardy souls turned up and risked committing the sin. At some stage in the 1930s, the, the date is not quite certain, Massey emigrated to London for work and again at some stage joined the Communist Party of Great Britain. From London, he was an early volunteer to join the International Brigades and may have been one of the earliest Irish volunteers to arrive there after the typical clandestine three-day arduous journey from London across France and down into Spain. His battalion number was 715, 715, and he was assigned to infantry through the number one company containing the Irish volunteers and com commanded by Kit Conway. After the notorious split meeting of the Irish in the base at Madrigueras on the 12th of January, 1937, he remained with the British battalion rather than transfer to the Americans. The battalion was deployed into action in the valley of the river Harama near Madrid on the 12th of February, 1937. And for this audience, I do not propose to go into detail uh, of the Battle of Harama. That is certainly set out in great detail in the book. I will just say this, that it was a strategic inflection point in the war. It saved Madrid and extended the war and the life of the Republic by three years. At the end of the battle, the dead of both sides totaled 45,000. Massey fought through and survived the three fiercest days of battle, including the great rally led by Frank Ryan and the Scot Jock Cunningham on the 14th of February. After those three days, Harama settled into three years of entrenched positions and the war continued. It was in the early days of that trench stalemate that Massey Quinlan was killed by a sniper as he tried to rescue a wounded comrade from between the lines. Along with many other soldiers of the Republic, he was buried in a nearby village. The victorious fascists desecrated the graves and dumped the remains on a rubbish dump. In 1994, under a socialist government, the remains of 5,000 fallen Republicans of Harama were respectfully reinterred, including those of Massey. Five weeks after he was killed, his family learned of his death by reading about it on the front page of the Irish Press newspaper. His father was traumatized by the news. And in his extended family, Mossy's name was hardly ever mentioned, and then only in whispers. In ultra Catholic Ireland, there was probably shame that he had died in Spain fighting with the Reds against the church. His brothers, however, never forgot him or what he died for. Terence was an early fighter against apartheid and for the rights of women workers. He was an active trade unionist and he eventually became general secretary of the Postal Telecommunications Workers Union. A few months after Massey's death, Eamon, at the age of 19, emigrated to England. Eventually, concerned at the rise of fascism in Europe, he joined the British Army and served for the entire five years of the war, attaining the rank of sergeant. In both Waterford and Britain, there is now a younger generation of Quinlans that take great pride in Massey's life and legacy, and some are active as he was in progressive and radical politics. In recording Massey's life, I recall the words of the great Jack Jones in his foreword to Walter Gregory's memoir, The Shallow Grave. The volunteers battled for a noble purpose, subsequently vindicated 
by the rebirth of democracy in Spain. It is surely right to record as much as possible of the human endeavor involved. Thank you so much, Liam. Uh, that uh, was a lovely uh, overview of, um, I suppose, one family's dimension, if I can put it like that. Uh, and um, I suppose the first question that occurs to me before I open it up to the general audience, uh, Liam, you, you have a particular family connection with the Quinlans. Could you just mention that to us? I will, Shay. Yeah, I, I didn't mention it in the talk because um, because it was a talk to the, the Labour History Society and I didn't want to personalise it. But Mossy would have been, he was my mother's uh, first cousin uh, and he would be my uh, second cousin. And uh, I see Michael Quinlan on the line there who would also be a uh, second cousin of his as well. And so um, in in the book, uh, an important part of the, the passages in From Shur to Harama is where I, I describe this kind of pall or cloak of immense sadness and grief and trauma that as a very, very young child, I sensed from his father uh, when he when he came to visit our house, and he was a frequent visitor to our house when I was when I was a very very young child, and uh, as I said, I should mention that Mossy, when he I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, whether they knew he had gone to Spain or not, because when he enrolled uh, in the, the international brigades, he gave his grandmother's address in Waterford rather than his his own home address, and they found out about it, as I said, on the front page of the Irish. It was literally the banner headline across the front page of the Irish press. Beside it was a photograph and a on the finish of the previous day's uh, Aintree Grand National. And it was obviously a paper that had a very, very wide circulation. And I don't know in what circumstances his father read that report or whether somebody called down to the house with him, but you can imagine the immense um, uh, trauma that that must have caused him. I certainly observed it 20 years after Mossy died. Interestingly, he, Mossy and his family were not unique in that. Uh, in the book, I cite some references from presidents and from Eugene McCartan, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Ireland, about the trauma. Two things were visited on families uh, of people in this, who had served in the Spanish Civil War. One was that when the men came back and they had survived, Many of them were ostracized. They were persecuted almost. And many of them were driven out of Ireland into emigration. And those that had been killed over there, while they were remembered by their family uh, in some cases, they were often forgotten about as well. And uh, so that's really, I think, the, the kind of story, if you like, of the trauma. I discovered that something similar happened with Charlie Donnelly as well that uh, his father was uh, so traumatized by the news of, of Charlie's death that he couldn't bring himself to even mention Charlie's name for 40 years after, uh, after the events in Spain. And I think that underlines uh, the depths of what people must have felt at that time. Uh, and I suppose that's the sensitive area for a member of a family to be kind of exploring this kind of storyline um, because, because um, I suppose we've got to go back in time to the uh, 1930s and indeed be, uh, later than that, uh, where any association with left-wing politics, particularly any association with communism, would have been a shame in a family. And whether you survived the Spanish Civil War or not, there was an element of it was no longer socially or kind of personally acceptable to be associated with that. Uh, so um, I suppose that's a kind of a, a double bereavement because I suppose if you go back kind of um, 15 years, if somebody was killed in the War of Independence, there was a kind of a, a heroic status, not just for the dead soldier, 
but for their family and kind of almost basking in the reflected glory of, of you know, their participation and their contribution. Spain was very different in Ireland. Obviously, it might have been a different dimension in, in the UK or, or whatever. Correct. Yeah. Spain on the on the Republican side uh, for the International Brigades fought. That, would, that was certainly true, James. Yeah. I've a couple of questions here, here Liam. Uh, the first question from uh, Dennis Lenahan was, uh, whereabouts were they reburied after the uh, remains were removed from that rubbish? Uh, okay. Uh, well, they were, as I understand it, they were the, the, the nearest village uh, to the battlefield. I think it would be five or six or seven kilometers away from it is Morata de Tahuna. Now, it, it was a village then. It's actually a, it's actually a, a fair sized town now. And so the remains would have been buried in the graveyard of Morata de Tahuna. And looking at the archives, um, such as they are at the International Brigades uh, online now, they're at the Moscow archives are now online, you do see records um, where the, the name of the, the dead uh, volunteer was recorded and the number of the, the grave would have been recorded as well. Uh, but unfortunately, all of that became obsolete once Franco and the fascists won the war. Because, again, I, I won't go into many of the people on, online here uh, today, I'm sure would be familiar with this picture. There was absolutely vicious retribution uh, by Franco and uh, the, the fascists against the losing Republican side. I mean, the pinnacle of which was the, the mass massacre, the mass murder of at least 150,000 uh, Spaniards. But even the graves were not um, respected by Franco, despite his ultra-Catholic uh, associations. So they were just taken up out of the graves and dumped to the side of the cemetery in Morata de Tajuna. And at some stage in the early 90s, a Frenchman called Francois Mazou, who had been a commissar at Harama, was, was visiting Morata de Tahuna and went to the cemetery um, and, uh, you know, just to look around and pay his respects. And some grave diggers who were working there uh, came up to him and uh, pointed out to him that there were remains of Republican volunteers literally thrown over the wall of the graveyard. And Francois Mazou began a campaign uh, uh, Bob Doyle and Harry Owens were involved in it uh, here in Ireland, and uh, France, uh, you know, Spain by that time had become a democracy. Felipe Gonzalez was the prime minister, and um, the campaigners were able to get Dick Spring, who was then the Irish Minister of Foreign Affairs, through the Party of European Socialists to link up with Gonzalez and encourage the movement. And the five, the, the remains of an estimated five thousand volunteers were reinterred honorably and with ceremony uh, in, I think it was 1994 or 1995. And the person chosen to give the speech uh, on that day on behalf of the Irish delegation very appropriately was Peter O'Connor, who, as I say in the book, and as Peter records in his memoir, was literally the last person from Waterford who saw Mossad alive. Okay, a further question, uh, Liam, is what difficulties did you encounter while preparing the work and was it easy to collect and process documents? Um, obviously, uh, COVID was, was something of a factor, but one of the good things now uh, I found with this book and with the, 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 la the previous book I did on the Limerick Soviet is that so much, so much of archives have now been digitized and have been moved online. Now, um, for the International Brigades, um, there is an organization in Moscow called Orgaspi. There, there are the Russian archives. And whatever document, now I'll start again by saying that probably many documents that were created in Spain stayed in Spain and were burned or destroyed. But those that were taken out of Spain back to Moscow under the auspices of the Communist Party have all been digitized. There's a, a, a wonderful, um, guide to it. And there's two ways you can access it quite easily. One is if you use, I discovered if you use the, the Chrome browser, it will automatically uh, translate 
the Russian site into English. And New York University, paid for by the American Lincoln Battalion Association, have also produced an online guide in English. So you can, you can find the name of the file in English. And then when you click on it and go into the document, it's actually a scan of the original document. So, um, so if, like in terms of going to the archives, that's relatively straightforward. Irish archives as well. The difficulty with Mossy is that he was in the very early part of the war. Well, yeah, the early part of the war, you could say. And the early part, certainly, of the British battalion being set up. And therefore, I understand that record keeping of the British battalion didn't really become any way systematized until maybe later in 1937. So that um, there are actually only, I think, from memory, three or four references uh, to, to Mossy uh, in the archives. Uh, and so there wasn't, for example, that you'll find on other volunteers and other Irish volunteers, there wasn't, for example, a personnel report on him. Uh, and the one archive which I, I had to really um, you know, verify through secondhand sources was the, um, the holdings in relation to the, 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 the British battalion in the Marx Memorial Library uh, in London. But again, the, there would have been very, very little in relation to Mossy uh, uh, because of the time that he actually joined the battalion. And maybe that takes us into a question from uh, Emmett O'Connor, uh, who uh, I suppose queries about the absence of personal information uh, on Mossy before Spain. Um, obviously, the family would be the normal custodian of that. and. Obviously, as you described, Liam, there was a, maybe a deep silence uh, about that for a long time. But uh, have you been able to dig up uh, the storyline of Mossy be before we got to Spain? Um, well, th that would be from, that is sparse, I would certainly say that. And that is certainly from uh, my own recollections of what I would have picked up uh, in family discussions. But as I said, uh, that was sparse. It was secretive. Uh, if you were in the room, the adults dropped their voices, they turned their backs to you, and they might discuss it for a couple of minutes. Now, the, one of the difficulties, for example, is that while Mossy's death was uh, recorded in the Irish press, I think in the Irish Times and the Belfast Telegraph, based on what looks to me like a Reuters uh, wire service report, there was no obituary or write up about him of any kind, uh, you know, in the local Waterford newspapers. There seems to have been just whether uh, some members of the family moved to shut that down, I don't know. I think it has to be said, and uh, Emmett would will, will, will be aware of this, that by Mossy went to Spain 1936-1937, by that time, the Quinlan family had split over the treaty of 1921. Some of them were pro-treaty. Mossy's father, as it happened, was, was anti-treaty. Um, and uh, by 1936, 37, uh, some of them were certainly involved in Fine Gael. One of his uncles was an election agent for Common and Gael, uh, in Waterford at that time. And some of them may well have been in the blue shirts. And I would speculate rather than state as a fact, that there may well have been uh, tic-tacking of some kind with the local newspaper editors to cover off any coverage in relation to Mossy. And secondly, that as I, I, I tried to describe early on, there was this omerta or silence in the family for decades afterwards, which makes it very, very difficult. All right? And unfortunately, I did get some help from uh, in the course of uh, researching the book, um, a nephew of uh, Mossy's, uh, son of Eamon, who now lives in England, who is a professor of history, as it happens, was able to help me with some of his recollections of what he'd heard from his father as well. Okay, this was the second part of uh, Emmett's question is, why does a water park boy join the IRA and the CP? And I suppose in the spectrum of uh, having gone to bad, uh, that was only in, next door from going to Spain and finishing the job. So um, uh, given the, the, the family history you described there of having split well, uh, over, over the treaty, 
um, like ending up in the 1930s uh, IRA and the Communist Party would be well, of course, quite, quite a journey. What I would say to that, of course, to, to Emmett, is he wasn't the only water park boy, because Frank Edwards uh, joined up as well. Uh, but I think that um, uh, the important formative background to him wasn't the school he attended or sport he played, was as I had, I think, outlined earlier on, this progression of his family from Young Irelanders right through to the volunteers and to Sinn Féin. I mean, Mossy's uh, grandfather stood with Eamon de Valera on an anti-conscription rally in Waterford, which had been prescribed by the police. So I think he was in this kind of, um, let's call it separatist or nationalist or Republican, very strong milieu. And there's a very interesting um, RIC report from uh, the second half of 1916, where they make the statement that um, the, the volunteers had split in Waterford because of uh, uh, John Redmond and the call to arms. And the, the phrase they use is, however, the only respectable family in Waterford that has stayed with the Irish volunteers was Alderman Quinlan and his sons. So they seem to have had, I can't explain this entirely, they seem to, I'll put it this way, I, I would make this claim for them, that when you look from the Young Irelanders to the Fenians to Parnell, to Redmond as leader of the Parnellite faction, uh, staying with the Irish volunteers, moving to Sinn Féin and to De Valera, they stood on the right side of history at all of those junctures. And I think Mossy was obviously imbued with that spirit as well too. I think what radicalised him was the fact that he was the first one of them, had to go out and get a job, and he joined the proletariat. And that brought him into contact with other young men of his age and also brought him into contact with them through his membership of the post-Civil War IRA. So he would have started a Republican, but migrated to the left. And indeed, uh, an often forgotten um, dimension is those who uh, took the parallel outside in the splits in the 1890s tended to be on the more anti-clerical or at least critical of the clergy uh, end of the political spectrum uh, and yes. um, you know that was a kind of a brave thing to do in Catholic Ireland uh, at that time as well yeah. and a further point that Emmett himself has made uh, on more than one occasion that um, the um, I suppose Amerta of the Catholic Church against communism really only took legs in the late 20s early 30s uh, as the, I suppose, grand plan of uh, seeking to undermine the Russian Orthodox Church seemed to be uh, coming to naught. And therefore, it was maybe more kind of socially acceptable in Mossy's formative years to have an interest in or maybe, you know, support for uh, communism or communist type uh, entities uh, in the 20s anyway. 30s obviously was was a different uh, story, but, you know, obviously yeah. he was he was learning in his in, yeah. in the 20s. One, one of the things I noticed, Jay, and I think Emmett uh, and Barry McLaughlin mentioned this in, in, in their book as well, is that we sometimes have this picture of Ireland of the 1930s under De Valera as some kind of a closed off society. But in fact, there were quite a lot of connections uh, between Ireland and other European countries. And the connection between Ireland, I mean, the Spanish Civil War loomed very large in the Ireland of the 1930s. And the Catholic Church loomed large, not only in Spain, but also in Ireland. And, you know, the historical connections go back to the, the, the flight of the Earls, the Irish College of Salamanca, the, the Spanish Armada coming to Ireland. Um, but what I found extraordinary looking at this was the, the mirror almost between Ireland and Spain, except there was a slight difference in respect of the Catholic Church. In Spain, the Catholic Church not only wielded um, immense ideological power through the schools and through the hospitals, but it, in its own right, it was a major landowner. And as a landowner was threatened by the agrarian reforms that the Popular Front government wished to bring in. Now, equally in Ireland, as we know from so many aspects of our history, the, the Catholic Church was immensely powerful and influential in Ireland. And while, of course, they owned convents and schools and so on, they didn't own, you know, a 10,000 acre estate in West Waterford 
in the way that the Duke of Devonshire did. So, but, but the ideological contention of the church in both Spain and Ireland at the time of the Spanish Civil War was very intense. And the background to that was that the 1930s was essentially a kind of a three-way tussle between the liberal democracies, uh, Stalinist communism, and German and Italian fascism. And the Catholic Church really reached a kind of a, an understanding with the Mediterranean version of fascism, uh, which was Mussolini and Franco. They were extremely wary of the German Nazi version of it, but in their hierarchy of what they were uh, feared of, at the top of that was Soviet communism. And uh, Liam, a very specific question about the book comes from uh, the Secretary of the Society, Kevin Murphy, um, notes that the opening of the book is 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 the dealing with the Battle of Harama, uh, where Mossi died, uh, and it works backwards. Is there a particular reason why you adopted that uh, approach to uh, writing the story? Um, well, you could say I wrote the story, or the story wrote itself for me. Uh, but I won't dodge away from it. I I took a conscious decision. It it's um, it's a it's a little bit different to the, the structure of what we call normal history books. But I just found that when I sat down, um, I wanted the reader so that when they came to Mossy's background and Mossy going to Spain and the trauma of Mossy's death, that they would understand from the very first sentence of the book and from the very first chapter what it was that had happened in, in Spain that, that had led to the trauma and the loss of memory and the recovery of memory, which I had to try and do in the book. So that was quite deliberate choice on my part. I didn't want to start it uh, in the traditional way of saying Mossy Quinlan was born at such and such a time and joined the CNA. And I suppose a, a further point to think about it is, uh, the experiences that he had in early 1937. Uh, the last Irish people that really had such an experience were those who were in the British Army in the First World War. Uh, that all the troubles that existed in Ireland in the interval never had a battle of that nature. Yes, um, no, I, correct. Um, and indeed, I suppose you could say, I, I saw something of an analogy, I won't stretch this too far, by with the men who came home from the front in the 1418 war and who found that because of the 1916 rising and the executions and stuff, that while they had gone away, hailed as heroes, um, they were reviled when they came home. And the, the Republican volunteers for Spain were never sent off as heroes, unlike O'Duffy's crowd, but they also came back, as did the 1418 men, to very, very hostile perceptions. But it is interesting to note um, that that um, that in the again in the hierarchy of military backgrounds and skills, I suppose across all the nationalities, veterans of World War One would have been at the top of that. And while there weren't pitched battles uh, such as there were in Harama or indeed in World War One in Ireland, there was a degree the Irish were seen, I think, as having a slightly extra degree of military attitude and military preparedness perhaps, than maybe some of the other volunteers. Although again, as I mentioned in the book, there was a, an outbreak of what I would call it a degree of stereotyping of the Irish by some of the British uh, apparatchiks who tended to paint a stereotypical picture of the Irish as being drunken and ill-disciplined and so on. But the record shows that in the battles, um, the Irish, and particularly in Harama, uh, in the number one company where, where Mossy served, they were right at the spear point of the battle, right in the thick of it. And indeed, as Porry Gates points out, uh, a, a, a short while later, uh, at least 60,000 people from the Republic of Ireland served in the British Armed Forces in the Second World War, in, in, including Porrick's uh, own father, if I recall correctly. So, and as I said, Mossy's brother as well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and indeed that, I suppose, story of people coming back to a changed world, it's like the Soviet astronauts who went to space and came back and the Soviet Union was gone. That kind of um, 
I suppose uh, the world having gone away is captured so well in Sebastian Barry's book. It's a long, long way. Uh, and uh, at least they, 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 they went off in 1914 as heroes. Uh, people going to Spain uh, from Ireland, uh, even if it was via London, didn't go off as heroes, uh, but they would have come back to, you know, a changed world anyway. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Just what uh, Kevin has thrown up the, a copy of, of of the book for people to see, and uh, obviously, Liam, you got a, a great mention in today's Irish Times. Yeah. Uh, yourself and, and Alan Kelly in the uh, Connolly books in Temple Bar, and uh, I suppose a small query has Alan defected to the Communist Party, uh, but yeah, well, uh, any publicity? I, 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 publicity? I, I, I think I, well, I'm not quite sure whether the young communists. Uh, on the night that he walked in the door, um, whether they were worried about him walking in the door or whether they welcomed him coming in the door, uh, but he did. Um, no, I just wanted, that's uh, just why the graphic is up there. The book is available uh, in about 25 bookstores throughout Ireland, and so I'm not going to give a big, big list. It is also in Carlton Books in Glasgow and in Hausman's in London, both which are radical progressive uh, bookshops. But if uh, people are not near the bookshops or they can't get to them, I'm saying that they might consider this uh, website, which is really a cooperative of self-published authors called bythebook.ie, and you forward slash and put my name. And from my point of view, uh, the merit of it is that the entire uh, cover price goes uh, comes to me from buythebook.ie rather than if you buy it in a bookshop where there's a cut of 45%. So that's the commercial end of the chain. Well, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a good piece. Just one, one further thought occurs to me, uh, Liam. Uh, obviously, one of the things we learned from the people who kind of participated in battles like that in the First World War is the trauma that they experienced as individuals in the kind of the rest of their life very, very often people were, you know, very damaged or burdened or, you know, whatever way they, they, they handled it. And we haven't heard kind of similar stories about, um, you know, people from the international brigades as to how it affected them in their, in their later lives. We, we tend to kind of have a yes. very heroic image of them, you know, going to fight on the right side of history, as you put it. And coming back, you know, with barely a scar on them, whereas people who fought in Harama and some of the other bloody battles, like, couldn't have just psychologically left it all behind them on the battlefield. Oh, I, I agree. Um, uh, I, I, I won't go into much detail about that. I mean, I have, I've had the, the privilege, the honour of knowing uh, reasonably well about four or five um, veterans of the of the Spanish Civil War when they were when they were alive. And it was a privilege to, to now. Um, I can say that out of that four or five, uh, none of them spoke very much uh, about the war. And I suppose I was at an age where, and I maybe I felt an aura that, you know, not to go poking uh, uh, around them uh, about it. Um, uh, I would say that there was one man that in my entire lay person's opinion, I would say, yeah, the, the way I put that he was carrying a burden of some kind, which which I noticed more in his case than I would have in the others, you know, and that's about all I would say on that. It's, it's inevitable. Um, I don't know whether in the UK, for example, somebody uh, uh, at academic level has done any kind of study on the, or indeed in the United States, maybe the Lincoln Battalion Association have done something. Yeah, in fact, as Dalton says, the experience of Republican veterans of the Irish Civil War would be an apt analogy. Uh, like the International Brigade veterans, they were frozen out of official Ireland in terms of employment, etc. Yeah, I agree with Des with that comment, and thank you, Des. And I maybe maybe just to go a little bit further. I've for uh, other work that I've done, I've looked extensively at witness statements in the Bureau of Military History on the Irish uh, War of Independence. And one thing that struck me, I've looked at maybe somewhere between 50 and 100 of them, is that, and maybe it was the event that I was uh, researching, uh, 
but only about four of them actually mentioned somebody being killed. You know, the number of times it struck me in the witness statements where you're told that we were told to go to such and such a crossroads and Vice Commandant Murphy would be there and there'd be an RIC patrol coming through. And then a few lines later in the statement, you, you see them say, oh, but we got a message and it was called off. And I just, I have a, you know, a, a pop psychology theory that, and maybe it was the way they were questioned, that, that quite a lot of them had actually cut that out of their mind. They, you know, they, like it, it struck me, I don't know whether anybody else has ever looked at them and had come to the same conclusion. The number of, if you like, unfinished actions in the War of Independence that are recorded in the witness statements. Indeed, and uh, that maybe touches on another point. In, in your introduction to the book, you talk about Kit Conway, and uh, Kit Conway was obviously a con direct connection from the War of Independence into Spain. Yes. And that, I, I suppose, uh, the military background of you know, some of the Irish participants, uh, it wasn't the first time they held a gun. No, and Kit Conway seems to have been an exceptional soldier. I... Um, I've read the witness statement of his uh, commanding officer in the War of Independence, a man called uh, uh, Commandant Tommy Ryan, who ultimately uh, became a, a, a colonel in the Irish Army. And he states that the way he puts it is that Kit Conway was the white haired boy of the brigade. He was so good in battle and so cool. And uh, he brought that with him to Spain and he brought all that experience with him to Spain as well. An exceptional leader. Indeed, uh, I suppose the caveat, the, 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 the footnote around Kit Conway was uh, Tommy Ryan's first introduction to him was they thought he was a British spy and That's he sent right. him into an attack by putting him on the front line That's to right. see how he'd get on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is one other name I would mention, um, a remarkable man as well. Kit, Kit was obviously killed in the middle of the first day of the battle. Um, the next second in command was killed as well. But a, a, an Anglo-Egyptian uh, called André de Mont uh, emerged uh, on the, towards the evening of the first day of the battle as the commander of the uh, number one company. And I think he really has to be credited with great courage, great strategic and tactical thinking. And he really held uh, Mossy's company together and made them a very, very effective force over the remaining days of the battle. Indeed, well, leadership sometimes comes to the top. Yeah. Uh, I think we've uh, received all our questions. Uh, Liam, I, I really would uh, like to thank you so much uh, for uh, what I think will really stimulate a lot of people and I would hope encourage a lot of people to uh, go out and purchase the book, whether in bookshops or uh, preferably in the circumstances uh, online. Uh, Liam, thank you so much, and the Labour right History right. Society uh, really appreciates uh, your, your time this afternoon. Again, I would encourage uh, anybody uh, here who isn't familiar with the Society to go and have a look at our website, irishlabourhistorysociety.com, and uh, you can uh, join online, and uh, our uh, annual publication, Sayer, uh, uh, comes uh, with a membership of the society and as I said in the introduction uh, Liam has a, a, a long history uh, of involvement uh, in and around the society so uh, again to wrap up uh, thank you so much uh, appreciate and uh, thank next, you, week, uh, next week uh, we'll have Luke Deneen uh, talking about uh, the early years of what's uh, today's trade union connect which was uh, the Irish Engineering uh, Union, which was set up uh, by way of a grant from Dahl Air and, and Constance Markovich's Department of Labour and played a, a pretty crucial role in the War of Independence. So uh, the Labour History Society seems to be kind of in military mode uh, these <laughs> days. Uh, but again, I invite you all to uh, listen to Luke uh, this day next week. So thank you very much and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much indeed to everybody. Slán.